here on behalf of the Processing Foundation and the P5JS project. And um, we're really happy to be able to put together a few sessions um, featuring panels where we're thinking about um, the web and, and things that we want to see in the future and hope that this can, um, I don't know, offer some, some discussion up for the W3C conference. Um, this panel I'm really excited to start with. Um, and it's basically trying to think about like, where are we with the internet right now? And where, where would we like to see it go? What is this future internet that um, we're hoping to see that is perhaps more eth ethical, equitable, and inclusive? Um, and a lot of the panelists here wear many different hats and they are writers and designers and artists and software developers and community organizers and all the and educators and all those things kind of rolled into one. Um, but I feel like it's really important to have artists and designers as part of this conversation to you know push on the boundaries of, of what we imagine for um, these technologies that we're building. So I'm I'm so honored and excited to introduce each of these panelists. Um, and we have Mindy Sue, Ashley Jane Lewis, Amelia Winger Bearskin, and Shawnee Nicolene Holloway. And I'm gonna do like a short intro before each person gives a short presentation. And then we will um, have time for questions all together at the end. Um, in the meantime, if, as they're presenting, if you have any questions, you can just put them in the chat and we'll kind of work them into the, the discussion or when, when we're complete, um, you can also use the raise hand feature um, if you wanna just ask your question directly. Um, so we're gonna start with Mindy and Mindy Sue is a designer and researcher. She holds an MDes from Harvard's Graduate School of Design and a BA from um, Design Media Arts from UCLA. And as a fellow at the Harvard Law School's Berkman Klein Center for the Internet and Society, um, she began an archive of cyber feminism, which she's going to talk more about, I think. Um, she has also been a fellow at the Internet Archive, co-organizing the arts track of the inaugural Decentralized Web Summit a couple years ago. Um, and she recently joined the Rutgers Mason Gross School of the Arts faculty in 2019, um, and has also taught at College, California College of the Arts and Yale School of Art. Um, so go ahead, Mindy. Thanks, Lauren, for the introduction and the invitation. Um, I'm just going to jump into this and screen share quickly. Are you seeing a big green slide? Yeah, cool. Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, as Lauren mentioned in the intro, I'm primarily talking about the cyberfeminismindex.com, which we actually launched last week with the museum and it was commissioned by Rhizome. Um, Probably the easiest way to describe cyber feminism is to talk about the word itself. So this prefix cyber came into being for the first time with Norbert Wiener's notion of cybernetics in the 1940s. And then it was later used in cyberspace for William Gibson's uh, Neuromancer in the 1980s. There was a lot of sci-fi coming out around this time between the 60s and 80s, but it was very much dominated by the male gaze. So you have these cyber babes and fembots and things of this nature. So when this uh, bridged with feminism, cyber feminism in the early nineties, it was really trying to use this merging of this prefix and this root as a provocation. So how can people from marginalized groups rethink what this no notion of cyberspace might be? Um, for the index itself, I tried to expand this into this idea of intersectional feminism as defined by Kimberly Crenshaw. And it was really trying to bring together this global perspective of what cyber feminism might include, even if they didn't use that name exactly. So in my research, I found Latin American hack feministas and Korean net femmes. And in the US, there's a lot of feminist Afrofuturism or Afro nowism. And the index was trying to also comment on this idea of the anti-canon. So how can we make it as permeable and malleable as possible? And in doing so, ideally it would be open source, open access and crowdsourced, which the current index currently is. So I just wanted to do a quick run through of a few examples of what's in this index. This is the cover image of Simeon Cyborg's 
uh, the, which includes a cyber cyborg manifesto by Donna Haraway. Um, video pieces by VNS Matrix, the Cyber Feminist Manifesto, Women's Web Ring, Mark Deary's Afrofuturism, Radhika Gajala Saris and Second Life, Prama Murthy's Bindi Girl, Muharas in Red, The World in Digitus Register, and Scawanetti's Time Traveler. And all of these things were coming out between the early 90s till now, 2020. And just to give you a quick overview of the website itself, uh, the website was inspired through two primary uh, concepts, this idea of how we might visualize citations and how we can create a site that ages. Um, one of the influences was the 100 Antitheses by the Old Boys Network in the late 90s. This came out three decades or two decades ago and still to this day the site is working really well because it is all static. Um, it only uses HTML and CSS and they've gone out of their way to not embed a lot of new technologies into it. So even as languages and browsers evolve, this website feels pretty durable. Um, as you move through the site, it feels fairly indexical and straightforward. Um, but the interaction of the website visitor is what makes it feel unusual. So you get the screen glow, you have the various highlights. The default form fields also change as you navigate the site. And I really wanted to make sure the site responded to behavior and only when someone was interacting with it. Um, so even as you click through the different entries, it tracks everything that you're opening and it reveals descriptive text and metadata, but it's also added to the side panel, which we're calling the trail. Um, this is not stored within the database itself. It's purely for the visitor's use. But what this allows is a download, which I'll talk about in a bit. And I also wanted to inject this idea of the cross-reference. So cross-references are typically seen in pr printed pages. Think about encyclopedias and footnotes and things. But within a current body, it allows you to move around to different entries that might offer a critique or a support of the thing that you're reading. So it tries to really encourage this non-linear reading experience. And for me, it uh, brought to mind this notion of gathering by Adrienne Marie Brown. Um, she's a writer and activist based in Detroit. And even when they do these big curatorial projects, she sees it as a form of gathering similar to this notion of the carrier bag theory by Ursula Le Guin. I have her book behind me somewhere. Um, but once you actually click the download in the trail panel, you would get this PDF. Um, all of these things are in Creative Commons. So as long as you give uh, some sort of physical citation, you don't actually have to ask for permission. And all of the things are excerpts. So it tries to include as many different voices in the index as possible. Currently, there are around 650. But even with the launch last week, I've already received about 50 new entries. So <laughs> I'm going to try to put that in in a timely manner. Um, but the site the PDF view is really trying to encourage how you might reappropriate this context for your own needs. And also thinking about Paul Swellis's idea of the download as an act of protest, um, as a way to kind of own these things that are often disseminated and not credited online. I don't know if that was five minutes or eight minutes, but that is all I have for you. Let me stop <laughs> that, that was wonderful. Um... I realized in my nervousness <laughs> in the intro, I forgot about the visual descriptions. Um, so I wonder if you oh. want to just give a little description of yourself and then you did, um, and I'll do myself after that. And you did a really good job, I think, of walking us through the interface, but I don't know if there's anything else visually that you want to say about it. Yeah, I guess a visual description of myself. Um, I'm currently sitting in front of the window. I'm wearing a black jacket and I have long black hair. I'm Korean American. Um, I'm a woman. And the catalog or the, the interface itself actually embeds a lot of these accessibility notions built in to the core. It wasn't retrofit. So all the images have very clear alt text, as well as when you navigate, it encourages um, easy ways to verbal or verbally and text-based communicate how you might be able to trans or trans traverse the, the content. 
Awesome. Thanks, Mindy. Um, and yeah, so just to catch you up, um, I am um, sitting in my home here. I'm a mixed race Chinese American. I have short dark hair and I'm a woman and I'm wearing a striped shirt. Um, and then I'm really happy to introduce Ashley Jane Lewis, who is an interactive artist with a focus on equity and speculative design. And her practice reclaims the black culture of the past present and future through computational and analog mediums. Um, her award-winning work has exhibited in Canada and the US, most notably at the White House website during the Obama, Obama presidency. And she holds a master's degree from NYU's uh, Interactive Telecommunications Program, a BFA in New Media Art from Ryerson University, um, and was listed was a, a listed spot on the 2018 Top 100 Black Women to Watch in Canada. So welcome, Ashley, go for it. Thank you. And I just apologies in advance. Um, it seems as though my uh, block has decided to do some metal drilling at this exact moment. So <laughs> I'm trying to use this close range microphone. So hopefully you don't hear any of that, but I definitely hear it. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to share my screen, get into some slides. Okay. All right. So as Lauren said, um, I'm really I'm really excited to be here. And as Lauren said, I'm a speculative designer. I'm a new media artist and an educator. And I like to make work inside the vein of Afrofuturism, also often referred to as Afro Nowism. I spend a lot of time thinking about the ways in which social justice and um, the ethics of tech intersect with my practice. And I think at my heart of hearts, the thing I enjoy the most or the way in which I most identify is as a community organizer. Um, so this is a, a snippet of a couple of art practices, uh, art pieces from my practice that are related to this topic. Um, and then I'll share with you a few that are more uh, from the hat of community organizer, but it all in my, in my head feels very, very interconnected. Um, so this is a piece called Heirloom Spaceship. This is a, a large scale interactive structure that uh, mimics, I guess, or metaphorically tries to mimic the idea um, behind reaching within to grasp strength and perseverance as a black woman navigating through the world. So um, the reason why I show this piece today is because especially through our opportunities that have become more present during COVID. This piece was based upon my lived experience, but a series of interviews and discussions I held with Black women, um, 32 Black women, to, to talk about and, and sort of ideate around like what these additional emotional labors uh, feel like and are experienced um, in, our, in our digital and real world. This is part of a series of work that I am uh, developing through both Culture Hub and a New Inc. residency for their Cultural Futures track. Um, it, the first project opened up an opportunity to do some research on um, how we determine futures. I'm really glad that um, Mindy talked about science fiction a little earlier because a lot of my work is really based upon that um, genre. And the research I've done to explore and discover uh, or stumble upon statistics that show that 70% of technology is directly inspired by science fiction. Um, it, makes, uh, it makes me excited, I guess, at the real world effects of literature and art, but very worried in the reality that most of science fiction is written by white, white men and then you know, creates the question, who is writing the future? Um, I think that within the spectrum of Afrofuturism, there are a lot of BIPOC individuals writing the future right now. And this project, um, this series of work really explores how to take uh, those nuggets of wisdom from BIPOC future speculation and embed them into real world technologies. Um, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, a lot of my friends and I were, you know, as the world was sort of just spiraling, trying to figure out how to help, where to help. Um, it's funny to be a speculative designer and then to find yourself in a moment of crisis, global crisis, and try to ask yourself, like, well, where does your practice belong in this, in this moment? 
And a good friend of mine reminded me that um, years prior, I had worked with a team to create and, and continue to develop this card game, initially founded by Sarah Rothberg and Marina Zerkow, that gives you world constraints around designing alternate more livable futures. And so um, <laughs> my friend's very wise note was, wouldn't that be something that would be interesting to do today as a response to the enthusiasm around defunding the police? So after the murder of George Floyd, we created truly the most rapid assembly of <laughs> 20 people to work on um, running this open opportunity, this free opportunity for largely black populations to explore the future and design a future without police. And um, the motivation behind that was to think, um, well, if we are trying to defund the police, we need to determine what comes in its place and we need to work together to think about how we'd like a system of community that's supportive and based on care to look. How would that look like or what would that look like? So we ran one session with our fingers crossed, hoping that we would get 20 participants, the, really the bare minimum we needed to play the game. And overnight, we had more than 250 applications from Black creatives um, and, and allies all over the world trying to also grasp <laughs> something that could help them imagine what a new future could look like. So this online community really assembled so quickly, and we ran 10 sessions over the summer and created 58 worlds um, that are, you know, in the process of being uh, distributed online to tangibly say to our community that here's an idea of what our, our future could look like. Um, so that was a, a really exciting opportunity. And I know some people in this call were in attendance and helped prototype. So many thanks to you as always. Um, here's a screenshot from one of our sessions um, imagining new futures that are, uh, you know, nodal based in terms of community representing um, spectrums of jazz and how jazz is, jazz is nodal and how we could emulate that as, a, as structures for community support. Um, I also spend a lot of time thinking about how we might gain wisdom for our internet presence for an eth equitable internet society from organisms, um, including the GIF on the left-hand side, which is an organism called slime mold. It doesn't grow, <laughs> this is very dystopian in how fast it grows, it does not grow that fast, but it is a, a rapid uh, accelerated GIF of an organism that does grow in that kind of like um, branch and node uh, way. And so this is a project that I work on with another Afrofuturistic artist, Io Consciende, essentially exploring how we might um, consider new conversations around digital immigration and, and you know, um, borders and how we identify as a society, as a global society from microorganisms like slime mold who are, they hold hundreds of sexualities, they have a, a distributed uh, nutritional um, distribution, um, they uh, have a non-hierarchical society that functions really positively. So we run these workshops across the city that allows for us to collaborate with Slime Mold and investigate how we might hold new futures together through what we learn about this creature. Um, so uh, in terms of um, more database projects, uh, I, I've run a few iterations of this project that crowdsource community data on um, black people who have died at the hand of, of police brutality um, and represent the data visualizations in these lungs that inflate and deflate in memorial of each one of these individuals. This is a piece that exhibited at Google Creative Lab as well as a few other galleries last year. Um, in my hat as a community organizer, you know, through the learnings of that art practice, I really spend a lot of time thinking about codes of conduct, community agreements, how we create ethical systems in intangible practices online. Um, this is a talk that I gave a few weeks ago, imagining the internet as a ball of yarn that needs to be detangled each time you join a new workspace. Um, I've been working for the last few years with an incredible team um, on a project called ML5. It's a sister project to P5 that allows for machine learning opportunities for new beginner coders and artists alike. 
And uh, through that experience, we've had to make some really tough decisions about how we um, adequately articulate our responsibility as technologists and artists to real world issues and situations. Um, this is a screen cap from the beginning of the pandemic uh, where we um, started an, a, a series of initiatives that made it clear that we were in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. One of those elements is redefining a very robust code of conduct for ML5 um, that we then later uh, emulated uh, for the ITP program at NYU. So I just have a, a couple of screenshots from that um, code of conduct. It's a heavy load to think about how to take a a technology space and an art space, which you know historically have not been very inclusive, and really make some strict parameters around how we imagine a future that is equitable for all of us. Um, these are my wonderful contributors, and this project has gone on to inspire five other technology schools to also create their very first, if you can imagine, <laughs> codes of conduct as well. Um, and I wanted to just leave it there and. Uh, I suppose maybe even just articulate how meaningful my art practice has been in helping my technological practice imagine new futures. Um, I think that the most powerful combination of, um, of, uh, of people has always been a mixture of artists and technologists. Um, I think it takes a lot of imagination to think about how technology might function differently now that we've been using it for the, the better part of our lives to create our, our society infrastructure. Um, and so uh, the, the speculation of imagining very, very out, outlandish wild futures helps to really unpin ourselves from what has uh, traditionally been our method of technological engagement. Thank you, Ashley. Um, that was wonderful. And I thought that last image was really beautiful. I wonder if you would give us like a quick visual description of that. And yeah. maybe if you want to describe yourself as well. Sure, sure. Yeah, um, let me go back to it. You see my messy desktop. Um, this is a picture of me standing with my back to the camera. Um, I'm standing in front of a pile of found objects arranged to look like a spaceship as as much as a child might design a spaceship from from found objects and cardboard boxes um this is a this is a image a structure that is also overlaid by a projection of space um all of which like you know the projection and the sound that emits from this project is governed by some touch sensors embedded in the found objects on the structure cheese grater metal bowls <laughs> the like and um, I, uh, I um, am a black woman, um, you know, an optically black woman, mixed race. Um, I'm wearing a blue sweater, <laughs> some iridescent earrings. Um, and I am standing in front of a blank, uh, blank wall. And um, yeah, I, I think that's everything. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Um, cool, so we're gonna go to Amelia Winger Bearskin. Um, who is the founder of Wampum.codes, um, which I imagine she's going to talk about. In 2019, she was an invited presenter to His Holiness Dalai Lampa's World Headquarters in Dharamasala for the Summit on Fostering Universal Ethics and Compassion. In 2018, she was awarded a MacArthur and Sundance Institute Fellowship for her 360 video immersive installation in collaboration with the artist Wendy Redstar, um, which is also supported by the Google Jump Creator Program. And she's exhibited at the Newark Museum and um, ASU in 2019. Mia is also the founder of stupidhackathon.com. Um, and she is Hodo, sorry, Hodi no Hodi no Shawni. <laughs> I said that terribly. I'm so sorry, Amelia. Um, of the Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma, dear clan. Um, so Amelia, do you want to take it away? Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be with all these incredible um, panelists. And everyone can see my video? Great. Yes. I'm going to actually um, really quickly stop sharing. So I'm going to post this in the chat is a description of my presentation so that you can have it available um, for closed captioning.
If history was written by the victors, then the future will be written by the vectors. Artificial intelligence will radically change our world, our lives, our planet, and it remains to be seen if it will be a positive or a negative. If it's said that those who fail to study history are doomed to repeat it, I would add that those who ignore data have underfitted models. When Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were looking for a new model to serve as a basis for the United States government, they were very impressed by the Iroquois Confederacy. We call ourselves Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse. We're made up of the Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, Mohawk, and Tuscarora. Thomas Jefferson spent over a year with us in upstate New York in one of our largest cities. When Jefferson and Franklin and the other founding fathers drafted the US Constitution, they cherry picked the best parts that were most beneficial to their own political purposes, the bits that seemed to align the best with their Enlightenment era ideology, representation, voting, checks and balances, etc. But they left out the social and cultural networks that sustained these practices in the actual Iroquois Confederacy. Well, what do they leave out? In the Iroquois Constitution, women, clan mothers from each tribe were the only ones who could vote for the representative who was always a man, a chief. Actually, the word for clan mother and chief is the same word. There was a balance of power. Only men could serve and only women could vote. Their economy was driven through complex agricultural arrangements. Everyone in the community participated in planting and harvesting. It was not an economy of slavery dependent plantation agriculture. This is an example of colonial mindset. I see it, I like it, I want it, I'll take it. I take it and I take what will benefit my own paradigm, but I'm unconcerned with the effect it will have being taken out of context and the effect it'll have on the people I take it from. This is like trying to run a program without checking its dependencies. What if it turns out that the Confederate democracy or lasting peace and prosperity is dependent upon a balance of power along gender lines? or upon a different economic model than the one practiced by European settlers in North America? Or what if it imagines a system of agriculture where the environment is protected and maintains sustainable practices? We all have colonial mindset just because our culture has colonial mindset. But here's the thing, we're not colonial subjects and we don't have to live under a colonial empire anymore. In data science, we talk about models suffering from either overfitting or underfitting. Overfitting is when a model exhibits a low degree of bias, but a high degree of variance. In other words, it accepts a lot of differences within the data, but it doesn't have very much predictive power. Underfitting is the inverse of this, high bias, low variance. This is what happens when you make a generalization without enough data, or when the data is not diverse enough to represent the real world. The big problem with colonial mindset is one of underfitting, extracting idea, without the context that made that idea work in the first place. I'm here to say, don't colonize our future. Our plans for the future need to include more data from diverse cultures and societies, and not only those ideas that flatter what we already think. For instance, let's say you wanna lay the groundwork for a society run on the blockchain. What does that look like? How does that work? What are the consequences? If we don't have significant data, we might just have to wing it. But we actually have thousands of years of data about decentralized economies. The use of wampum um, among the Iroquois functioned as a decentralized distributed ledger of contracts, and it helped us govern, govern our society for centuries. Wampum is an example of what I've termed antecedent technology, and there are many more cases like this. In South America, the Inca had a Turing complete system of knot tying called Kipu, which predated modern computing by hundreds of years. When we want to use powerful new technologies such as AI or blockchain, and we want as much data as we can to help us imagine positive change in the world, we do not need to throw out thousands of years of data that can fuel the next giant leaps our communities will make with technology. I want people to know that indigenous people had technologies that have solved complex issues. I want us to use their data to help us dream our future, and I want us to believe that just because we have had 500 years of slavery, worker exploitation, poverty, and gender imbalance, we have had thousands of years of peace, prosperity, and equality right here in the country where I'm standing right now.
Thank you. I am in my home, in my office. There are plants behind me. I am a woman. I have short hair. I am Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma Deer Clan on my mother's side, and my father is Jewish. I'm wearing a red shirt and a beaded collar. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. That was so wonderful. Um, okay, and then lastly, we have Shawnee, Shawnee <laughs> Megalane Holloway, who is a new media artist and poet. Known for using sound, video, and performance, Holloway shapes the rhetorics of technology and sex sexuality into tools for exposing structures of power. Currently, Holloway teaches at the New Arts Journalism and Film, Video, New Media, and Animation Departments, a lot of departments, at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, so go for it, Shawnee. Thank you so much. Um, I am not going to have any screen shares, so I'll go ahead and um, kind of just describe what I what you see on the screen. Um, I'm a light skinned black woman. I'm wearing a very long um, sort of very dark black straight um, haired wig situation. Um, I've got some glasses on and a shirt with swirls that is actually playing with some of the webcam al algorithms, it looks like um, from my side. And I'm sitting in a place in my room where there's books and um, a big like furry blanket sort of to my left, <laughs> don't know my right from my left. Um, and that's me. And yeah, I, I do teach a lot and I do have this practice um, and it goes through many different iterations. But one of the things that I'm always thinking about is like, man, like it don't gotta be like this. <laughs> like none of this stuff <laughs> has to be like this, none of it. And we all decided it in some way and some of us didn't really get a say, um, but now there are so many more opportunities for us to get a say. And so I'm sitting here in the midst of all of this stuff because I live my life in this computer thing. And I'm like, what do we do? <laughs> you know, part of this is also, you know, um, coming from a sort of older internet artist generation of like, we used to hang out with our friends in Second Life, with our friends in Second Life, and we used to do all this stuff in the computer. And I'm also feeling this resistance of like, where do all the weird, counterculture, like angsty internet artists go? Because like, I don't really want to be with everybody else, and now everybody's on the computer. So where do we go? And um, that just increases this thing about like, oh my God, what do we do, right? Um, and so I was invited um, to a symposium. Um, called Freedom of Speech, um, a curriculum for studies on darkness that was actually um, using Anwar, uh, Amar Kanwar's film, Such a, a Morning, that was made in 2017 as a point of departure. Um, Laura Rakovich and Karen Kuoni invited me um, for that to talk through like how the internet can facilitate this kind of freedom. And I basically walked in, I was like, it can't, here's why. Um, and so they were like, maybe we should elaborate on that. I don't know about that. <laughs> and they invited me to write this text. And, and I wrote this text called Of the Web as a Home Front in regard to freedom of speech and freedoms in general, right? Um, some of the things that I hear, especially amongst sort of the, the young ones that I'm in class with so greatly, they remind me all the time, like, I'm trying to get free, you know, and I'm like, me too, I think. Um, and their energy towards that is so good. And I wrote really this as like a, you know, sort of perspective of, of these students sort of asking me all the time, like, what do we do? What do we do? And me feeling, what do we do? What do we do? Um, and so these are just a few notes from that, um, from that, uh, what's it called, that text that I had written. Um, and there's a lot of information that's kind of missing. So um, it'll come in the text, but hopefully we can piece some things together. Thinking through the history of technology as a fluid mode of transportation for rich and abstract content, we think we see everything from the light bulb to Morse code to fintech applications as creating agility for the communication of different types of complex signifiers that either replace written language or provide a subtext for that written language with gestural relationships and expressions, which we also give the name language, but here I'm using a capital L. The web's dynamic system of paths and destinations engenders and distributes abstractions of these languages and language systems. These not only perform the efficient computation and storage of information, but also also the more domestic and complicated exchanges that information uh, provides, including but not limited to spoken language through the tr transmission of audiovisual representation of nuanced human functions or feelings through this video chat stuff um, and, uh, and many things more. But not only are these examples of the limitlessness of what networks should be charged with, um, but it's also what, the, what makes the internet um, and by extension the web so dynamic um, and such a mysteriously 
sort of beautiful and risky and desirable place to inhabit. When the web as we know it became the internet standard, the white linear page focused copycat structure of the book became locked into our imagination and has since dictated what kinds of content can and should be created for the entirety of digital space, right? So we have the things like the window, um, the page, these sort of metaphors. The familiarity cum legibility of the structure of the book form loaded with white Western ideologies of how knowledge is produced and circulated tricks us into thinking that we are being held to that exact same structure and standard as those made for the words on the page and that the internet is somehow the answer right to the analog printing technology seemingly unsolvable shortcomings right like not being able to jump off the page not being interactive this is undesire or understandable when we consider how the earliest net services such as transmitting uh, academic research and cataloging information um, were sort of intended um, from libraries across distances, right? But to think alongside American artists as highly structural effacement of language um, is part and parcel of the colonial roots of web development and central to the Wild West uh, metaphors that continue to influence how we approach dis digital technologies. In their essay, Black Gooey Universe, they remind us that whiteness, as it often follows in the wake or, of, of the ruin or literal death of blackness um, and darkness, both requires and multiplies market-driven products that are anti-black, an echo chamber of white ideals, uh, or an ivory tower and the creation of public facing devices and platforms where white space is posited as neutral. That was a quote. Uh, from its developers, the web has inherited this faux neutrality as a method of making itself more legible for early adopters. While neutrality might be sound like a good thing for freedom, um, it can't exist alongside equity and without equity, we can't have freedom, right? Um, so American artists presentation of a racialized color theory, um, that being from dark, blackness, darkness and the terminal to whiteness and, you know, sort of streamlined things um, is one way to measure the effects of the GUI. But this is that part where I'm like, what do we do? <laughs> um, it's hard to imagine a world where we could replace the web, right? So if we're sort of in this mode, where it's just like tear it all down, it's all broken, which sometimes I, I feel, um, you know, like I, there's all, always these also conversations about like, well, if the web didn't exist, what would? Um, yeah, but it's hard to imagine a world where we could replace the web entirely with an entirely new system that had suddenly fixed all of these things um, and its failings. It might be useful to find a method of maybe re refactoring it. Um, and so this is some this word refact to refactor, right? To um, sort of go in and rearrange um, code uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that that structure. And generally it's used maybe to make a code easier uh, to read for folks who are working on it later, or maybe um, to fix code for backwards compatibility, something like this. Um, yeah, uh, sorry. It might be useful to find a method of refactoring it, making the inner workings of the web a complex behemoth, right? Um, at least more suitable towards a malleable future and the liberation of the individual user. However, in order to refactor the web, a collective decision must be made about what it should and should not be used for moving forward. It is likely that privileges and inconveniences to which users have become accustomed will be difficult to discard, even in the name of a space that supports a truer freedom or a truer accessibility. So initiatives towards a web that centers freedom have long been in motion thanks to writers and scholars and these creative folks. Um, some find and study the errors and disadvantages of their dominant virtual networks. Visionaries such as Ted Nelson with his Xanadu project, for example. Um, there are others who have triggered or experimented with the web shortcomings and inconsistencies, including artists from the collective electronic disturbance theater who use creative coding uh, to create platforms for server jamming, the virtual protests, uh, and the larger glitch movement that have made space for beauty and richnesses of failure. Um, and there are also who are those who are given the opportunities to build on top of our network landscape, like game developers, journalists, and social media users. They use, um, they collectively work together to mold digital culture through language, um, uh, sorry, through the language of the capital L, poetics, um, multilingual text content, coding, 
typing languages, et cetera, into a comfortable tool that centers support for free and open distribution of whatever, including but not limited to individual basic freedoms like freedom of speech, freedom of choice, freedom of movement and innovation, right? So using it as a platform to talk through these things as a way of like sort of putting forth um, representation. But however, when something is broken, although we've tried our hardest to fix it, we are forced to begin to consider getting a new one. And in the way that Ted Nelson may have recognized in his early research that the medium of the book wasn't suitable for the screen, as we sort of touched on earlier, how it really pigeonholes us into thinking a certain way, we should begin to recognize that what characteristics of the web aren't a good look for the internet or for us or for us moving forward um, and fix it because it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't, we made it. <laughs> it can be any way we need it to be. Thank you, Thanks. thank you so much. Um, Cool. So that was our, our last presentation. And I want to open it up now to have a little bit of conversation between the panelists and with participants. Um, before I do that, I was suggested in the back channel here that I give a little context for this P5 JS thing that I mentioned, which is actually the way that um, I think we all sort of know each other or like through extended networks. Um, and it I think it relates to something you were just talking about, Shane, which is like, how do we build how do we build different things? Um, and so P5.js, just to give a really short description, is uh, an open source library for um, making creative work on the, on the web and learning to code. And I think what's been important to us about it is that these values of inclusion and diversity and access really are central to the project. So rather, you've heard a few different speakers talk today about like rather than trying to retrofit things like accessibility or um, thinking about outreach or inclusion to a project after it's built, these are really the grounding principles on which we tried to build and which upon which we, you know, made mistakes and learned and reworked and rethought and reimagined. But that's been sort of the, um, the guiding um, vision for that project. And so that's um, one of the kind of kernels that brought this conversation together. We wanted to elaborate on some of those ideas. 